So let's think about where we've been this year. Uh, if you recall back to last term, we actually spent a lot of time on statistics. Uh, firstly, we did a bit of a review on um, descriptive statistics, statistics that allow you to describe a group or a population. Uh, these were things like mean, mode, and median, so uh, measures of central tendency or measures of location is what we also called them. Uh, and then you had things like interquartile range, um, standard deviation, so these are measures of spread. Uh, we had a look at all of these and I hope that was sort of ringing bells from previous years when we looked at statistics um, but the important thing that I want to emphasize is and you can see it here on this graph we were always looking at uh, single variables in fact when we were doing a lot of those calculations um, on your calculator we would go into the stats mode and then we would select one var do you remember that and one var of course stands for one variable in this case it's temperature um, that you can see over there on the horizontal axis and we often have a vertical axis too, but when you're looking at a single variable, the vertical axis is pretty much always, as you can see in this example, frequency, like how many things of those particular values do you have? Do you have many days at 20 degrees? Or you know, do you have just a couple at uh, 18 degrees, as an example, right? So when we moved from single variable statistics to add another variable, you might recall this is called, yep, it's bivariate data, right? So here you can see, again, it's a two-dimensional uh, chart, but it's, it's quite different because the vertical axis here represents a whole other data point, right? So here we're comparing two uh, quantities that are clearly related, um, the number of customers who walk into a store and the amount that you actually make in sales uh, based on that number of customers, okay? So bivariate data, because this was newer to us and we were going to explore it in a lot more depth, this is where we introduced a bunch of new concepts. So just to sort of refresh your memory a little bit, um, I wonder if when you guys look at these um, charts here, if you can remember, what, what's this referring to? What's, what's different across these different images? Um, and it's this idea of correlation. Do you, do you remember that? Um, you've got two variables like, like say sales and number of customers and they can be very closely correlated. Like if you know the number of customers who walked in, that enables you to very accurately predict how much was made in sales at the shop during the day. And that would be what we call a, a positive correlation. And some of the correlations are high, other ones are low. It's like, I don't know, they're roughly vaguely in the same area, but sometimes there is no correlation, right? It's kind of like um, your, uh, let me give you an example. Um, you know, the, the, the temperature in the day might have zero effect on, you know, how many sales you have if the thing that you're selling doesn't have to do with hot or cold. Like if it was ice cream, that would matter. Um, if it was something like a car, maybe it wouldn't matter, right? So sometimes there is no connection, no correlation. Um, and also, as you can see on the charts, correlation can run in two different directions. It can be positive, which means that as you increase one, the other one also increases, um, or it can be negative. Um, when you get more of one, you get less of the other. So I think if you recall, back to not the most recent task you did, but the one before that, which had statistics in it, um, I think we gave you an example scenario where you've got um, a school and the exam marks of students. So the two variables, the bivariate part of it, was um, English marks and maths marks. And as an example, this obviously doesn't have to be the case, um, but in this particular data, Set, there was a, a negative correlation. Students who did better in English tended to do poorer in mathematics and, and vice versa. Now it's not always the case but perhaps there was something going on with this school that accounted for that and that's what we call a negative correlation. Now one of the things that we noticed was well we want to be able to quantify what's going on like these words like high and low sometimes we saw words like moderate um, they're all a bit vague and flaky like one person's high might not be the same as another person's high and so you're like well what do you actually mean so what we did was we introduced a numerical way to describe correlation and I wonder if and if you remember what it was called, um, it had a special name. Um, we called it, yeah, Pearson's coefficient. So this is the number which, um, you know, it maxed out at one. That means that, um, you know, they're perfectly positively correlated. It went to zero, which means there's like no connection between the two variables. And then also we saw negative correlation, which means you've got a negative Pearson's coefficient, right? Now these are not the only things we explored in bivariate data. I wonder if you remembered we took plots of um, you know information like this, and then we would draw something through it, um, much like this. Now I wonder how many of you remember what this is called. 
Um, it's a line of best fit, yes. Um, you could also call it a trend line if you want it to be very fancy. You could call it a regression line. Um, all of them mean the same thing. It's a line that kind of fits what most of the data looks like. It gives you a sense um, to, you know, what's the general shape of this thing? Is it going up? Is it going down? And what that line of best fit or the trend line lets you do is, you know, sort of guess at where you have gaps in your data. So, do you guys recall what's it like when you try and make a prediction about some unknown data point, but as you can see for this one, it's within your data set. Yeah, this one's called interpolation because it's in the data set. Whereas if I gave you a point out here and said, well, my line of best fit predicts that if you had you know, um, 11 customers, this is what would happen. Um, I don't actually have a data point there. So um, this is outside of our data set and that's why we called it, do you remember? Um, extrapolation, okay? So um, that's all really helpful. I just hope that sort of jogs your memory. Um, the important thing that I want to get across to you, which is our um, bridge into today's new content, is that everything we looked at in Bivaria data, closely anyway, everything we really investigated, was what we call a discrete random variable. Okay, now I hope that that phrase is sort of somewhere kicking around in your brain, but maybe you don't remember what it means. A um, variable, of course, refers to the fact that you've got quantities that change, like sales numbers, they go up and they go down. Um, random means there is some kind of sense that each different thing is equally likely, each different outcome. Um, and this word discrete, this is the one I really want to focus on. Discrete means that you've got separate values. Um, distinct values is the way that I used to remember it. Discrete means distinct. Um, sales, they're in dollars and you count them out, right? It's like a specific number of dollars. And um, the customers is the same. Like you can't have 10 and a half customers. You either have 10 or you have 11. Um, and so wherever you've got um, values where they take on specific numbers and they can't go in between. This is what we call a discrete random variable. Now some of you will recall right at the beginning of statistics we kind of waved this flag but then we didn't really touch it. We did say that there's other kinds of data that's not discrete. There is what we call a continuous random variable. And the whole idea here is that you don't have um, specific numbers and you can't go in between. The whole idea is that you have a continuum of values. And these, I'm really excited about learning these things properly with you. This is what we're gonna dive into for the next couple of weeks because um, number one, um, they are, they're everywhere and um, they're really important to understand. And number two, um, the tools that you use to understand this have some really fantastic connections to other knowledge that we've developed as you'll see shortly, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, okay? So let's think about continuous random variables. Why do we care about them? Um, let me give you some examples, okay? Number one, a lot of the data that we actually encounter, um, like I mentioned before, it doesn't fit into nice neat categories. So anytime basically you measure something rather than count it, if you measure say a temperature, right? Um, your thermometer might say 37 degrees, but it might say 37.1 or it might say 37.05, like it kind of, you're only limited by the accuracy of your instrument. So there's, there's a continuum there, right? So if you've got continuous data, then you would use continuous random variables to represent that. But here's the kicker, right? Even when you've got a discrete set of data, a discrete distribution, even that sometimes can be helpfully understood using a continuous model. So here's an example for you, okay? If you took 20, coins um, and just sort of spilled them out onto the table and then you counted how many were heads and how many were tails, right? Um, and then you repeated that experiment over and over again. Then you would get data that looks something like this. Um, you're looking at a plot that gives you the, uh, the relative frequency. You can see um, the vertical axis, it's P of X equals X, so that's a probability, right? So however many number of experiments you do, you divide by that number of experiments. How many times did you get seven um, heads out of 20? How many times did you get 11? heads out of 20, okay? Now, when you have a look at this data, which I wanna remind you, it comes from a discrete situation. So you can't have, you know, one and a half, um, you know, tails or something like that. You can only have one or two. Even though this is discrete data, I hope you can see the, the, the shape of the data itself kind of implies that there's sort of a curve underneath this, right? And this is because the data set is sufficiently large that sort of, you know, you've got this um, behavior around it that is not, doesn't look discrete, it actually looks continuous. And that's what you can do here. I actually went into Desmos and I had a bit of a fiddle and I came up with an equation that very, very closely matches the data that's being presented. So I know this equation looks messy, but the point is, it's a continuous model that fits um, discrete data. 
okay? And so number one, your discrete data can sometimes look like continuous data when you have enough of it. And the other thing, which is sort of this secret superpower that continuous models have, is that they enable you, um, if you, um, you know, extrapolate better, to make predictions about what's going on, right? So let's have a look at this set of data here. Do you remember having a look at this idea of a logistic model, which is a continuous model that we use to represent um, a discrete situation? Like this is the number of cases of COVID-19 in a particular city. You can't have 500 and a half people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, you either have 500 or 501. Now, despite being a discrete situation, a continuous model is useful because it enables us to make predictions about the future. And that's kind of a big deal, right? Like policy decisions. When do we reopen our economies? When are we allowed to have sport again? When are we allowed to, you know, um, eat into restaurants again rather than have all the delivery? All these things are very practical questions that depend on continuous models.